and uh, I decided that uh, I'm going to be playing football at the University of California. That was Kevin Hart. No, not the Kevin Hart you're thinking of. This Kevin Hart is white, and he stands about 6 feet 5 inches tall, weighing upwards of 300 pounds. He has the build of a dominant football player, which he was, in his small town of Fernley, Nevada. Kevin Hart dreamed of playing football at a Division I school. If you're not familiar with college athletics, then all you really need to know is that schools are ranked, athletically, by divisions. Division I schools often have the highest budgets, with world-class facilities and top-of-the-line amenities, while Division III schools are more appropriately lumped in with community and junior colleges. D1 schools are the ones you see competing for national championships and bowl games, while D2 and D3 schools often get left out of the conversation entirely. So Kevin Hart had his sights set on attending some of these D1 universities, and in the clip you just heard, he had made his choice on which school to attend, the University of California in Berkeley. Unfortunately, for both Kevin and his loved ones, he would not attend this college, because everything leading up to this big announcement, an assembly with close to a thousand people in attendance, was nothing more than a calculated hoax. Kevin Hart grew up in the Bay Area, more specifically in the city of Oakley, California, roughly 50 miles away from the UC Berkeley campus. His parents, Rick and Marlene, were good parents, but they were hardworking, so their attention was often focused elsewhere. Kevin was just one of four children, and with him being the oldest, he was often guaranteed to get less attention than the rest. Growing up, Kevin loved watching and playing sports. In particular, he loved baseball and football, but the latter was his true passion in life. He wanted to play Pop Warner football as a kid, but he often exceeded the weight limits. He was a pretty large child after all, and due to some safety risk, he was not able to participate. So, he settled on playing flag football in local rec leagues, where he excelled. His youth coaches often remarked that he had an incredibly high sports IQ, making him a bit of a whiz when it came to team strategy. In his early teenage years, his parents, Rick and Marlene, started to come upon hard times, financially. This forced them to move from the ever-costly Bay Area of California to a dusty little town about an hour outside of Reno, Nevada. The town, named Fernley, had an incredibly low cost of living, and with a small population of just 13,000 or so, it seemed like a good place to begin planting roots for their family. As Kevin and his siblings began to assimilate into the area and the schools, full of unfamiliar peers, the Hart family received some bad news. Kevin's aunt, whom he had been really close with, passed away. The two had bonded over several dozen trips to the Oakland Coliseum, where they had both watched the Oakland A's together, and her passing hit him incredibly hard. During this time period, as Kevin struggled to fit in during his freshman year at Fernley High School, he withdrew into himself. His once wisecracking behavior slipped away, and the shy kid that was intimidated by social interactions surfaced. But it was also during this time period that Kevin began to indulge himself in the one true passion that had guided him through the dark times in his life. Football. Fernley High School did not have a weight limit to its football team, so Kevin Hart began playing for the junior varsity squad. Unfortunately for him, the school was not very good during this time period. Fernley High had a reputation for being a bit of a pushover squad, and Kevin was no exception to that. He was a pudgy player with no real skills. A fellow player described him as a quote-unquote slug, a joke that implied he had no speed whatsoever. And even Kevin's own grandfather, George, stated flat out that Kevin was weak. He said the teenager could barely lift his own weight, and described him as a quote-unquote marshmallow. That is, he was big and rotund, but very soft. 
That all began to change in Kevin's sophomore year, when a coaching turnover remade the Fernley High football team. Enter coach Mark Hodges, a middle-aged, bald man that looked every bit of a football coach. He came into the school with the understanding that he would get to remake the program from the ground up, and he would have time to oversee this transition. When Coach Hodges stepped into the program, he noticed Kevin. After all, when you see a kid that's six and a half feet tall, weighing 330 pounds, it's hard not to notice him. But at this point, Kevin had given up on the football offseason workouts, and he was debating giving up the sport entirely. At the time, Kevin was playing first base for the Fernley High baseball team, and Mark Hodges convinced Kevin to start playing football once again. He was remaking the team, and he had brought along an offensive line coach named Chris Cribbs to assist in his effort. Cribbs, who had once achieved results as a college football lineman, saw raw potential in Kevin, and began to work with the teenager to fine-tune his skills. The two coaches worked with Kevin over the summer and the fall, helping him trim some of the baby fat and getting him into playing condition. As they continued to chip away, they also discovered that the shy, ho-hum Kevin had a personality as well. The more that Kevin participated in practice and workouts, the closer his relationships with his teammates became, and the more that he emerged as his old, wisecracking self. By Kevin's junior year, he had been remade into a star player for the Fernley High School football team. By this point, he had lost over 30 pounds, and he was in the best shape of his teenage life. As he began to take strides on the field, people began to notice. Namely, Division I universities. In his junior year, Kevin had started to receive recruitment letters from colleges and universities throughout the nation. The University of Washington was his most aggressive suitor, sending him a letter once a week or so, but Kevin rarely gave them any notice. All he knew is that schools were interested, but he had plenty of time to make his decision. However, that time continued to move faster than anticipated. As his junior year came to an end, he began to realize that he was running out of time. You see, Kevin had read all of these letters. He knew that they were, for the most part, form letters, mailed out to almost every high-level athlete in the nation. If colleges and universities thought that they could convince you to play for them, they would. However, you'd also be going up against the best of the best, so you had to prove yourself, not only athletically, but academically as well. Throughout his high school career, Kevin had only needed a 1.5 GPA to remain academically eligible. This meant that he only needed to maintain a D average to keep participating on the football team. He had developed a reputation among his fellow students and teachers for being a particularly poor student. Not because he was dumb, mind you, but because he was simply disinterested. He never applied himself. He was constantly late to class and barely ever paid attention his mind constantly on athletics or other things going on in his life. So, going into his senior year, he had continued to ignore his academic issues. He figured that if a school wanted him badly enough, they'd be able to look past it. Unfortunately, none of them could. The letters continued to pour in, but none of them were full-ride scholarship offers. Instead, they were form letters asking him to apply and submit not only his football tape, but his academic transcripts. During this time period, he tried to arrange a trip up to Seattle to visit with the coaches of the University of Washington. His parents, who were struggling with four kids, were not able to pay for it, but his grandfather, George, was more than willing. George, just like Kevin, was dreaming of big things for the 17-year-old. According to Kevin, the trip went well. He visited with the coaches, who seemed to like him, and he even took in a Mariners game at Safeco Field. Quote, I went up there, I liked it, but I really didn't think they knew who I was very much. So I sent them a tape and my transcripts, and that's probably why I never heard back from them again. I'm pretty sure it was the transcripts. Not to be deterred, Kevin's grandfather then helped arrange another trip for the young man, up to Eugene, Oregon, for the annual summer camp at the U of O campus. The coaches there seemed to show a little bit of interest in Kevin, but they weren't exactly blown away. To them, he was a meddling offensive line project, 
a kid with professional size but very few outstanding skills. It was Kevin's grandfather, George, that took their signs of interest as something other than what it was. To him, the coaches at Oregon were very interested, based off of offhand remarks he had overheard. So it was Kevin's grandfather that continued to tell everyone that Oregon was quote-unquote very interested, and it was Kevin that had to temper their expectations. Except, he didn't. At least, not really. Now in his senior year, Kevin was continuing to play at an outstanding level for Fernley High School. After all, his field of competition wasn't exactly out of this world. The area had never had a Division I athlete before, let alone anyone with professional skills. And here was a player that was on the cusp. So he literally and figuratively bowled over the competition, eventually earning area and state honors as an all-pro offensive lineman for Nevada. It was perhaps these mixed expectations of himself that led to an imbalanced ego, with one side of him well aware that his academic qualifications were less than stellar, and his on-the-field product that was currently blowing everyone away. In September of 2007, right at the onset of his senior year, he was asked by a student writing for the school newspaper if he was still being recruited. Kevin said that he was, and when he was asked about which schools were still recruiting him, spouted off some of the biggest names in the country, including Nevada, Boise State, Washington, Oregon, Cal, and Oregon State. According to Kevin, Oregon and Washington had extended full scholarship offers, but he was also considering adding Illinois and Oklahoma State to his watch list. Kevin had begun calling himself D1 in anticipation of his future prospects. Unfortunately, he was beginning to box himself into a corner, and soon, there would be no more room for this lie to continue to grow. In January, Kevin approached his coach, Mark Hodges, with the idea to hold a big assembly on the first day of February. This was when high school football players throughout the nation could begin to announce their intentions to sign with a college or a university. Kevin's idea to hold a big assembly in front of the school and everyone was a way out of this hole he had dug himself into. At the very least, it would help silence the questions. Coach Hodges excitingly agreed and began making plans to turn it into a school-wide event. An assembly was called, as the area was noticeably excited to have their first D1 athlete. The marching band was assembled, and clubs began organizing the creation of banners and streamers to show their support of Kevin's achievements. In public, Kevin was undecided on which school he had chosen. However, in private, he was telling those close to him that he had narrowed down the decision between the universities of Oregon and California. In a confidential conversation the week before National Signing Day, Kevin told offensive line coach Chris Cribbs that he was choosing Cal. Not only was their style of play most similar to the offense that Fernley High ran, thus making it the most obvious place for Kevin to excel, but it would also allow him to return to the Bay Area, where he had grown up and made many childhood memories. Three days before Kevin's big day, Cribbs sent an email to the offensive line coach at the University of California. He thanked the other man for giving Kevin an opportunity, and for helping obtain a scholarship for the young man he had begun to view as a son. Alarms should have been raised when he read the response from the coach at Berkeley. Quote, Chris, I think there's been some misunderstanding here. We have not offered Kevin a full ride. Are you sure he's not going to Oregon? Let me know. You have me wondering. Cribs gave Kevin a call, and asked him what was going on. Kevin insisted that everything was okay, and he told his offensive line coach that nobody at California could comment on recruits until they were officially signed on. He specifically told Cribs that there was nothing to be worried about, and that all was still well. On January 31st, 2008, the night before this big assembly, Kevin put a bulletin on his MySpace page. Simply put, it read, quote, Tomorrow is the big day. All of Kevin's friends and classmates were eager to find out what his big decision was going to be, but for the most part, they had to wait until the very next day.
February 1st, 2008, was the day when football ambitions were beginning to be announced to the sports media. Future NFL celebrities Julio Jones, Robert Quinn, and Terrell Pryor were making national waves as they made public spectacles of their intentions. But in this small little town of Fernley, Nevada, all eyes were on Kevin Hart. Every student and teacher piled into their Fernley High Gymnasium, which had been decorated to accommodate Kevin's big decision. Banners bearing his name, along with congratulations, plastered the walls, and streamers and balloons were prepared for the big moment, when he announced which university he would be taking his talents to. Not only was the school at full alert, but Coach Hodges had arranged for the local media to be there as well, to document this momentous occasion. Kevin was the area's first Division I talent, and hopefully, he would not be the last. About a thousand people had their eyes on Kevin as he entered the gymnasium, wearing a collared white dress shirt, black pants, and an orange tie. Coach Hodges got the crowd riled up, announcing his excitement for Kevin's future. Kevin made his way to a nearby table, where two hats had been laid out in front of him, one belonging to the University of Oregon Ducks, and the other belonging to the UC Berkeley Golden Bears. He thanked his family, who supported him through his football career. I just want to say thank you to my family over there. I mean, everyone at this school has been so supportive of what I've been doing. Then, he finally made the decision that everyone had been waiting for. And uh, I decided that uh, I'm going to be playing football at the University of California. When asked why he had chosen the University of California, he told reporters, quote, Coach Tedford and I talked a lot, and the fact that the head coach did most of the recruiting of me kind of gave me a real personal experience with that coach. And we had, like, a really good relationship. The unfortunate part is, of course, that Coach Jeff Tedford of the University of California Golden Bears had never met Kevin. When asked by reporters later that day of his recruitment of Kevin Hart, his response could be summed up with one single word that's generally typed in all caps. Quote, What? BearInsider.com, a recruiting chat room for the California Bears, was surprised about the recruitment of this little-known offensive lineman from outside of Reno, Nevada. However, members of this message board had nothing but kind things to say about this unpolished lineman. Quote, First D1 player to come out of that high school, he must be a superstar at the school. Quote, I think this qualifies as a kaboom. Quote, Yes, I have seen him play. He's pretty good has college size, good skills, good addition for Cal. Quote, sounds like a great young man with size and attitude. Quote, I think Kevin Hart will be one hell of a sleeper recruit for Cal. All of this attention by Cal alumni and backers, however, put the spotlight directly on this teenage recruit. School officials at Fernley High were contacted by employees of the University of California, who demanded to know what was going on. They said that Coach Tedford had not once ever met with or tried to recruit Kevin Hart. In his own words to reporters, Coach Tedford said, quote, didn't talk to the kid one time, never recruited him. Going into Friday afternoon and Friday evening, the suspicion began to be raised that this was all some kind of misunderstanding. Was Kevin confused as to which teams were recruiting him? Reporters reached out to Oregon coach Mike Bellotti, who told them that while Kevin had attended their summer camp, they had never actively recruited him. Quote, He was in our camp. We evaluated him. We did not recruit him. Coach Bellotti stated that Kevin, while he did have the size to play Division I football, lacked the necessary talent. He also later stated that, regardless of what was happening, that it was a quote-unquote shame. Now people were beginning to grow concerned that Kevin had been tricked or deceived by someone, perhaps an imposter of California coach Jeff Tedford. 
When news of the scandal hit the nearby University of Nevada, head coach Chris Alt was in shock. He was familiar with Kevin, after his scouts had done some preliminary research after Kevin reached out to them earlier that year. However, he knew that there was no way that a Pac-10 school like Cal was extending a full-ride offer to Kevin. Quote, We knew of the kid. He was in our camp, but he's not a scholarship athlete. Over the weekend, Kevin refused to comment. Multiple news outlets were trying to get a hold of him, including national publications like ESPN, Deadspin, and even mainstream journalistic entities like the Huffington Post and the Washington Post. Telling a reporter, Kevin said, quote, I'm not going to make any comment on it. I don't mean to be impolite. I'm just going to hang up the phone. Officials at Fernley High School also refused to comment, including interim school principal Dave Regalado, who referred all questions to Terry White of the Lyon County School District. Likewise, White also became unavailable for comment. In addition to the athletic world, the teachers at Fernley High were in shock as well. They had become concerned when it was announced that Kevin would be signing on with a Division I school, fearing that his grades would disqualify him from any prestigious programs. However, after his big assembly, announcing his intention to sign with UC Berkeley, the teachers were horrified. After all, these were the teachers that knew he could not pass through the NCAA Clearinghouse, the institution that tries to ensure all student-athletes put an emphasis on being a student. Students that go through the program need to maintain a solid GPA to participate in any athletic program. And while Kevin was a great offensive lineman, he was not a generational talent that could avoid any and all academic responsibilities. He was simply a good football player, who was currently failing four classes, including English. Within hours, Kevin's big announcement had become toxic. Later that evening, Kevin was confronted by his parents and coaches, who wanted to know what was going on. Earlier that day, they had been expecting Kevin to make a decision that would set him up for the rest of his life. Now, it was looking like he had either been the originator or the victim of an intricate hoax. Kevin, when confronted by his parents and his two main coaches, Mark Hodges and Chris Crisp, panicked. He doubled down and told them that he had been duped by a recruiting agent who had stolen his money. When asked the name of this agent, he reached into his imagination and blurted out the first name that came to mind, Kevin Riley. It's worth noting that Kevin Riley happens to be the name of the then starting quarterback for the California Golden Bears. The following morning, Kevin Hart was taken to the Lyon County Sheriff's Department, where he filed a police report. This report alleged that he had been tricked by a fake recruiting agent whom he had met at a football camp the summer before. This agent had apparently loaned Kevin some money, which he had then repaid, with interest totaling upwards of $500. When asked by the police to provide any contact info for this mysterious Kevin Riley, Kevin Hart began to falter. He had nothing. No phone number, no email address, no address. Nothing. Just a name, a generic description, and a serious allegation which would trigger an investigation from not only the sheriff's department, but national authorities. Mike Longe, who worked for the Lyon County Sheriff's Department, stated about the police report, quote, It would be fraud, obtaining money under false pretenses, something along those lines. From what I understand, there is not a whole lot of evidence from this kid, so I don't know how successful an investigation will be, but we will see what we can do. As national collegiate authorities began looking into the incident, the Lyon County Sheriff's Office began sharing their information with the Nevada Interscholastic Activities Association, the NIAA, in the hopes that they could find the person responsible. Eddie Bonine, the executive director of the NIAA, stated about this, quote, Was the kid duped by somebody impersonating somebody and that got him to where they were? There are some red flags for me. One, at no time did any coach or representative speak to the head coach at that high school. Two, you would ask, has the student athlete, thinking he's going to be a Division I athlete, did he pursue the NCAA clearinghouse since his sophomore year? That didn't happen. Or, did the student athlete make this all up and got in too deep and couldn't turn it around? The thoughts expressed by Bonine were pretty close to the mark. But as the media began to theorize about every possible angle this story could take, Kevin Hart was stewing. You see, his entire high school playing career had led to a single moment. 
him sitting down at that table, and choosing which college he would take his football talents to. Now that that moment had passed, and he had to live with the ramifications, there was nowhere else for him to hide, no other lies for him to tell. He took the next week off from school, shutting himself up in his bedroom, hoping that he could take back this one little white lie which had now grown beyond his control. On Wednesday, February 6th, the day which is best known as National Signing Day, Kevin had to announce to the world that the last year of his life had been a hoax. Looking back at this time period, Kevin Hart would later admit that he was not in the right state, mentally. Quote, I didn't see any consequences to any of it because I was not in the state of mind to realize what was wrong or right, really. Through Lyon County School District Administrator Terry White, Kevin released a statement to the world at large. In it, he admitted that he wanted to play football at a Division I school more than anything. Quote, When I realized that wasn't going to happen, I made up what I wanted to be reality. I am sorry for disappointing and embarrassing my family, coaches, Burnley High School, the involved universities, and reporters covering the story. Lieutenant Rob Hall, who worked for the Lyon County Sheriff's Department, stated, quote, I've been with the Lyon County Sheriff's Office for 18 years, and I've never seen anything like this. Lieutenant Hall continued, quote, Initially, we thought if this was in fact a hoax or something Kevin came up with, maybe he was trying to put his name out there and create some interest. Or maybe he just thought it was going to be, and when it did not happen, rumors started and it just got bigger and bigger and he did not know what to do. That's why we want to sit down with Kevin and talk with him to get his perspective about what happened. Where did it start? When did it start? As police and school officials began to look deeper into the incident, they discovered a well-crafted lie that extended back to Kevin's junior year of high school. The schools that Kevin had been talking about for over a year, who had sent him the initial form letters in 2006, had never heard back from Kevin, and they weren't even sure that he was going to go to college. There was no sign of correspondence between Kevin and any of them, the universities of Nevada, Washington, Oklahoma State, etc. Lieutenant Rob Hall stated about the police report Kevin had filed less than a week beforehand, which was now determined to be false. Quote, The people who have talked to him say he's really embarrassed, ashamed of himself. It sounds like he's learned his lesson. Representatives of the Lyon County Sheriff's Office would not say for sure whether charges would be filed against Kevin, but it seems like, based off of statements by Lieutenant Hall and other officers, that they felt pity for Kevin more than anything. After all, he was a teenager who had built up his expectations to the point of being unable to accept less than a Division I university. When that had not come to pass, he built a lie that he pinned all of his hopes and goals on, in the hopes that something, anything, would come along and make his life better. In a Deadspin article published on February 7th, 2008, they summed up a lot of the thoughts people had with Kevin Hart and his orchestrated hoax. Quote, it's a vivid and poignant reminder that as much as we obsess over college sports recruiting, these are high school kids, prone to the same fits of immaturity we all were at that age. Kevin Hart did something very dumb, because that's what teenagers do. Dumb things. He just happened to do it in an industry that obsesses over the every whim of 17-year-olds. Poor kid. After this incident, everyone began looking for someone to blame whether it be the parents of Kevin Hart that did not realize how out of touch they were with their oldest son, the coaches that seemed too distracted to deal with the off-field activity of their star player, or the media that had built up this National Signing Day into a marketplace for athletes that are, in so many words, still children. One of the biggest focuses of the blame fell upon Kevin's head coach, Mark Hodges, who had to tell reporters why he had never found it odd that no head coaches would have contacted him. After all, when universities recruit players for full-ride scholarships, they're getting ready to invest over $100,000 in these players, and they generally want to do their homework before taking that leap. Coach Hodges responded to these allegations. Quote, There's no one who was more of a sucker than me, but it was a perfect storm. There were letters and phone calls from coaches. He's all state. The best lineman in the state. Things I can't even tell you. Plus, I'm teaching and getting ready for the next season. I missed it. Because, like I said, 
it was a perfect storm. Another main lightning rod for the media's ire came upon Kevin's parents, who seemed absent through these major decisions that Kevin was making. Rick Hart, Kevin's father, seemed hurt that Kevin felt the need to keep all of this hidden from them through his senior year of high school. Quote, I wish Kevin would have come to us, talked to us, and told us that he didn't have his grades or his GPA up high enough. We could have worked with him somehow to get that. We could have hired a tutor. It was degrading to both my wife and myself. We're not disappointed in him. We're just disappointed in the actions that led up to all that. We wish he'd handled it a different way and not lied. I've heard a lot of people comment about, ah, oh, this guy, the parent, he should have known what the process was for recruiting. Well, I didn't. Despite the media pointing the finger at both Kevin's parents and his coaches, Kevin came forward and accepted 100% of the blame. Quote, That's the thing that bothers me. When they blame my coaches, my parents about, ah, oh, why didn't they stop this? This could have been stopped. Sure, it could have been stopped. By me. I could have put an end to the whole thing in September by saying, I don't have the grades, so I'm going to go to a junior college. But I did not do that. You have to understand, they put a lot of trust in me. I just told Coach Hodges I was taking care of it myself, as far as sending tapes out, talking to coaches, my grades. I wasn't popping up on ineligible list, so he thought my grades were fine. I thought it would be hard on all of them to find out it wasn't going to happen, so I kept it to myself. When people look up to you in the school and you're kind of the big man on campus, it's hard to just tell them that no, I can't do this, and you go back to being just a person in school. Because for me, I was big man on campus for a while. After it was revealed to the world at large that Kevin had been lying to everyone for months, he struggled significantly. He did not attend school the week following his big assembly, and in that week, the media had turned from believing him to be a victim to believing him to be a monster. Quote, I thought I'd be in the gutter somewhere. The few friends that actually spoke to Kevin in this time period describe him as suffering from a depression so severe that he was near suicidal. After all, not only was he becoming a laughingstock in the region, but the national sports media was tearing him apart. George Hart, Kevin's grandfather who had supported Kevin's football dreams, could not bear to see his grandson in such a state. He began to pay for Kevin to attend therapy sessions, in the hopes that he'd be able to dig himself out of this hole. Quote, I love my grandson, and I didn't have the vocabulary or background to lead Kevin out of this. Within a few sessions, his therapist remarked that there was light at the end of the tunnel, but it would take time and effort from Kevin to get there. He finally returned to school a little over a week after his disastrous pep rally, and the taunting and teasing he had first experienced upon transferring to Fernley High School resumed. He was no longer the big man on campus. Quite the opposite, in fact. Kids began to mock him, asking him if he had decided where he was going to go to school next year. During a basketball game, an opposing school wore shirts bearing the phrase, I'm going to Cal. Over the next few months, Kevin struggled to get back some sense of normality, but after deciding that he was going to leave behind football for good, he began to put back on the weight he had lost a few years beforehand. Over the next few months, he put on at least 30 pounds. He tried to make amends to the many friends, family, and school officials who felt betrayed by his actions. Most seemed to accept him back with very little foresight. However, it was Chris Crisp, the offensive line coach that Kevin referred to as his quote-unquote other father, that gave Kevin the iciest reaction. Their relationship seemed permanently fractured, and this caused Kevin to withdraw even further into himself. To his credit, Football coach Mark Hodges began trying to get Kevin back on track. Even though this incident seemed poised to ruin his own reputation, he was looking out for the teenage Kevin, and he began looking into junior college programs with the young man, in the hopes of getting him interested in football once again. Kevin, though, wasn't really into the idea of continuing his football career. Quote, I knew I wasn't going to play, and I honestly didn't want to play. I was so down on myself. I mean, it's a game of egos. And when you have one sky high, and then you have one at absolutely zero, it's tough to play. When your whole life gets flipped upside down because of something you do, you don't know where to go. So, college football was not on the list of places I'd go from here. I figured, why would anyone take a chance on me? To me, it was over. As the news of this hoax began to quiet, 
Kevin Hart began to prepare for life without football. Over the next few months, he would receive letters from throughout the country. Some of them were hateful in spirit, accusing him of damaging the integrity of college athletics, stuff like that. Many of them, though, were hopeful. People were supportive, and hopeful that he'd be able to get his life back on track. One of these people was Tom Seamy, the head coach of a football program in Northern California. Feather River College is a small school located in Quincy, California, which is not anywhere close to being a Division I school. It's a two-year program, which usually does not attract the D1 or D2 caliber of player. Coach Seamy had held discussions with Feather River Athletic Director Merle Trueblood, who followed the news of Kevin Hart's fall from grace closely. Immediately after it was revealed that the entire ordeal was a lie, while the media began turning on Kevin, these two decided that he was the type of kid who needed to be picked back up. He was the kind of kid who could still achieve great things, with the right amount of guidance. They tried for months to get in touch with Kevin, until one day, he finally responded to their inquest. He was agreeable to give football another shot, and outside of the spotlight, he would be given an opportunity to play for this two-year program. If all went well in these two years, he could then apply for another D1 or D2 school as a junior. Coach Tom Seamy and Athletic Director Merle Trueblood met with Kevin and gave him their pep talk. The basic idea was, quote, Life shouldn't be over at 18. You have your whole life ahead of you. They did not have to sell Kevin much at all, though. He was already sold with their positive behavior and uplifting attitudes. It was just what he needed. Throughout training camp, coaches noted that Kevin had an extremely high player IQ. Despite his reputation for being a poor student, the kid was not lacking any smarts, just a proper outlet for them. When it came to picking apart schemes and blitzes, he excelled. He did not play that much as a freshman, coming in as a bench player and spelling the starters from time to time. Then, he had to miss the entire 2009 season because of a knee injury, which allowed him to extend his playing time at Feather River College. In his junior year, 2010, he became academically ineligible to play, due to repeated problems with his grades and attendance. However, during this time, he began to serve as a volunteer football assistant, a season in which he helped coach the offensive line, and earned the attention of everyone in the organization. Merle Trueblood, the athletic director for Feather River College, stated about this season, quote, Once he coached a little bit and saw what it was like, he learned the meaning of accountability, because nobody cut him not any slack on the staff, not any slack, make him accountable. He did all the dirty work, so to speak, being the lowly volunteer. No slack was cut whatsoever. He did laundry, but that's what he needed. And then he got his grades right, went to school and class, and then he came back. In 2011, Kevin's fourth year at a two-year institution, he was finally able to step onto the playing field, where, just like high school, he blossomed. He put on a clinic for the Feather River Golden Hawk offensive line, game after game, eventually becoming what Merle Trueblood referred to as, quote-unquote, one of the best linemen we've ever had. At this point, one would expect Kevin's playing career to be nearing its end. However, because of the way his college career had unfolded, sitting for most of his freshman year, being injured his sophomore year, and being academically ineligible to play for his junior year, he still had some more college football eligibility. Division I and Division II schools were both sniffing around Kevin once again, wowed by the natural talent and leadership he had displayed at Feather River College. In his senior year, he had been named an All-Pro California Junior College lineman, and he looked like he had mentally matured. However, the D1 schools, the universities that Kevin had once coveted, were wary of him for two reasons. Not only was he tainted by his 2008 hoax, but he also only had one more season of D1 eligibility. Weird college rules make it so that players can't just transfer schools, at least not without sitting out for a season. However, if he were to attend a Division II school, he could feasibly start both seasons. So, now Kevin found himself in the middle of another bidding war. And this time, the bidding war was real. On February 1st, 2012, National Signing Day, 
Kevin signed a legitimate letter of intent to attend Western Missouri State, where he would play for the Griffins. The Griffins were a good fit for Kevin, having just finished the season 9 and 3. Because they were a D2 school, he could participate in both seasons, and show the world that he still had more football left in him. This time, the letter of intent was legitimate. There was no made-up conflict, as he did have a legitimate offer from both Western Missouri State and Concordia University St. Paul, deciding to go with the former at the last minute. This time, the decision came with no pomp and circumstance. In a simple Facebook post, he announced his decision to the world. Quote, Signed and faxed. So happy to be a part of Missouri Western. Thank you to all my family and friends for love through the years. It had taken him four years to get to this point, but Kevin Hart had finally made the National Signing Day decision he had once dreamed of. Of course, it was not with a Division I school, but it showed the world that he still had the skill to compete with some of the best in the nation. Tom Seamy, the former coach of Feather River College who had recruited Kevin to give football a second chance a few years beforehand, stated about this decision. Quote, I definitely think it's a happy ending. We knew from the beginning this was a kid who had some problems and had some issues. Not just academically, but let's face it, probably emotionally. But he was still a good person, and that's what we believed in. His potential. He screwed up and kind of paid a public humiliation price for it. And then he went underground and had to get a lot of things figured out. But clearly, over time, he has. And here he is, man. It's pretty cool. Kevin Hart, speaking to reporters about his decision to head to Western Missouri, said, quote, I'm very thankful someone took a chance on me again. I'm excited. I'm going there to get an education and to work hard on the field. I'm 22 years old now, and in a different spot in my life. I'm more mature. His decision to attend this D2 school happened to come exactly four years after his initial assembly announcement, on February 1st. He did not realize the coincidence until later on, or, at least, he did not draw any attention to it. Quote, I didn't realize it was exactly four years later. It'll be a good day for me. It'll be an emotional day. A lot of people say, oh, but he didn't go Division 1. But there's still a lot to accomplish at Division 2, and I'm ready to get to work. Kevin Hart did attend Missouri Western State for a single year. A year in which he redshirted. He did not see the playing field, but during that year, he made the biggest decision of his life. Bigger yet than his decision between Missouri and Concordia University and even bigger than his made-up conflict between Cal and Oregon. In 2013, before the season even started, Kevin made the decision to leave behind football. And the spotlight. For good. He intended to spend more time with family. A decision that anyone can sympathize with. Through this whole ordeal, in which Kevin struggled with the expectations placed upon him, he had learned some valuable lessons. And it seems like this last lesson, Learning when to leave behind football for something more was just a stepping stone in Kevin Hart's hard-earned path to adulthood. Through that time period, in which he stepped out into the unforgiving world that knew him as a liar, Kevin never once blamed anyone else for his own childish mistakes. He owned up to them, a lesson I would not expect of many, let alone a teenager. The story of Kevin Hart is still ridiculed in college football rankings every year, among humorous stories like that of Floyd Raven whose mother forged his signature on a letter of intent. Or Chris Warren, who flipped a coin to make his own choice. So many of these national recruiting stories are turned into gimmicks, and the media loves to turn these athletes into something larger than life. It's easy to forget that, at the end of the day, these are just children, who are forced into high-pressure situations and dissected under a microscope. When a player like Kevin Hart cracks under the pressure, you end up with a situation like this. Thankfully for Kevin Hart, who was put into a lose-lose situation. He somehow found a way to come out on the other side, a winner.